Good morning, everyone. To those of you who are fathers, having Father's Day. It's good to that so many of you brave the elements to get out here today. It's like you tour. If you haven't taken the new tour before, I'm sure it was an adventure. Today I'm going to uh, give a Buddhist talk on the Chinese school. Uh, this talk is going to be about yellow cork trees. One specific yellow cork tree. The yellow cork trees are uh, not found a lot in Missouri. They're, they're actually discouraged from being planted because they're an invasive species. However, there is a male version of the yellow cork tree that is non-invasive since it doesn't produce fruit. And uh, I looked into trying to secure a yellow cork tree for today's talk. However, I would have had to go to Maine and uh, spend like $160 on the tree itself and bring it back to the ship. But maybe one day we'll find a yellow cork tree that we can plant here that's non-invasive. So in Chinese, the uh, word for yellow cork tree is Bo. So there's a mountain in China. Uh, the mountain is actually, from what I can gather from uh, looking on Google Earth, it's kind of a rounded hill. Uh, not so dissimilar from the kind of hills that are around here at Lava, but it's called a mountain. And uh, this mountain is called Huangbo Mountain, probably because it has many yellow cork trees on it. And uh, there is a monastery there. And from this monastery, there was a great teacher who took on the name of the cork tree yellow cork tree, and uh, he was known as a master of one ball. And he said, all the Buddhas and all sentient beings are nothing but one, the one mind, beside which nothing exists. The one mind alone is the Buddha, and there is no distinction between the Buddha and sentient beings. To understand what uh, this great master was teaching, we need to have a deeper understanding of how it is that we can penetrate into understanding what the mind is. And to do that, we need to have a little bit of an understanding of our what it is that, our, that we are made of. And the master not so long ago gave a talk about the, the five aggregates, the five skandhas, what we're made of, uh, which includes our body, our form, uh, the sensations that we feel, our feelings, our perception of things, and our mental formations, which is like our habit energy of how the mind works rather automatically. And finally, our consciousness, which is a memory stream. So in one of the uh, suttas of the Buddha, called a piece of foam, the 
Buddha talks about in his five aggregates, and he uses a metaphor for each one, or simile for each one. For form, he calls it a piece of foam. And for feelings, he calls this a water bubble. And perception, he calls a mirage. And mental formations, he calls heartwood. And then consciousness, he calls magic trick. And this is all found in uh, the Samutta Nikaya 22.95, the Fena Sutta, Fena Foam. When he gets to the heartwood, which is the mental formations, this gives a more direct understanding of trying to know what the mind is. He says, now suppose a man desiring heartwood, in quest of heartwood, seeking hardwood, were to go into a forest carrying a sharp axe. And there he would see, in this case, a large banana tree, straight, young, enormous height. He would cut it at the root, and having cut it at the root, he would chop off the top. Having chopped off the top, he would peel back the outer skin, peeling back the outer skin, he wouldn't even find sand and sapwood, say nothing of hardwood. Then, with a man with good eyesight, would see it, observe it, and appropriately examine it. To him, seeing it, observing it, and appropriately examining it, it would appear empty, void, without substance. For what substance would there be in the banana tree? In the same way, a monk sees, observes, and appropriately examines any mental formations that are past, future, or present, internal or external, blatant or subtle, common or sublime, far or near, to him, seeing them, examining them, and appropriately examining them, they will appear empty, void, without substance. For what substance would there be in mental formations? In another teaching the Buddha gave in the Dhammapada, probably most beginners, would start reading the words of the Buddha, might like read the Dhammapada at the very beginning in a section called Pairs, meaning two things that are linked together. Mind perceives all mental states. Mind is the, their chief. They are all mind wrought. If with an impure mind, person speaks or acts or behaves, suffering follows him like the wheel that follows the foot of an ox. An ox. In the second verse, mind precedes all mental states, mind is chief, they are all mind right. If for the pure mind a person speaks or acts, happiness follows him like a never departing shadow. Also in the suttas, there's another teaching in the Samyutta Nikaya called the leash. It is just when a dog is tied by a leash to a post or to a stake, if he walks, it won. He walks right around the post or stake. If he stands, he stands right next to that poster stake. If he sits, he sits right next to the poster stake. If he lies down, he lies down right next to the poster stake. In the same way, an uninstructed run-of-the-mill person, an uninstructed whirlwind, 
regards form as this is mine, this is myself, this is what I am, he regards feeling and perceptions, mental formations and consciousness as this is mine, this is myself, this is what I am. If he walks, he walks right around those five clinging aggregates. This is the delusion. that occurs when the mind is stuck. So it is Huang Po who really is attempting to shake us free from that delusion. And shaking free from that delusion is not easy. So there are a number of teachers who came along attempting to teach us, to liberate us from this delusion. Certainly the Buddha, 28 teachers after him, Bodhidharma, did the same by taking the teachings to China. Then six teachers after that, we have Klingon, important, number six in the lineage. And then after Huynan, there are several other important teachers that come down a particular lineage. So Huynan number six, the next important one, number eight, Mazu. And then Master Bai Zhang. Bai Zhang, very important because he really revolutionized some of the practices make them much more amenable for lay people. So Baijiang turns out to be Master Court Tree's teacher, Huang Bo. And Huang Bo turns out to be the teacher of Lin Ji. Now Lin Ji is the lineage for which we practice here at Nava. It's uh, number 11 after Bodhidharma Ji is one of the five great family houses of Buddhism uh, in China. Uh, only two remain, the Linji house and the Zhaodong or Soto. In Linji in Japanese would be Renzai, Zhaodong in Japanese Soto. So sometimes we, those people who study Japanese Buddhism would know about those terms. The other three houses have dissolved into those two. So because we're in the Linji lineage, studying the work of Master Quark Tree on Bo. Very, very helpful. So, Huang Bo's, uh, actually his uh, ordained name was Shi Yun. But he took on the name of the court tree because of a number of different factors. Now, Huang Bo is, as I said, located between, uh, actually near a, a promontory, a peninsula that goes out into the Sea, uh, the Strait of Taiwan, and it's located really on the uh, Mao, uh, on the on the Ming River, and about halfway in between Shanghai and Hong Kong. For those who are not so familiar with Chinese geography. The U.S. coast is a little concave, and the Chinese coast is convex. And, um, I would say maybe Beijing would be right where Boston, but a little bit more inland, and then Shanghai might be more like Washington, D.C., you know, Baltimore area, and then Hong Kong might be Florida, down in that area, and in between there, Maybe Savannah, Georgia, you know, might be comparable to where um, 
full job. Even the England, Fujian, Fujian province, this mountain, great hill full of cork trees and dead. So there are records that talk about Master uh, Huang Bo. Uh, one of them is the Manling record. This was written by a minister who um, lived a little bit north of Wang Bo, Mount Wang Bo, and invited Wang uh, Bo to give teachings and studied with him. And he wrote a text about him. This uh, minister's name was uh, so what do we know about Anbo that is noticeable? First and foremost, we know that it, he was very tall. Probably they say maybe seven, what we would call seven feet tall. And he had a rather large bump on his forehead that they uh, said it was uh, like a round pearl. And if you picture this massive fellow. So uh, when Ong Bo and met his teacher, Bai Zhang, Bai Zhang stated, kind of surprised to see him, he said, uh, Magnificent, imposing. Where have you come from? Huang Bo replied, Magnificent, imposing. I've come from the mountains. Later, he said, uh, Bajan said, Why have you come here? And Huang Bo said, for nothing else. It's just to study the master by John. Another text that talks about uh, Hong Bo is a very famous set of stories called the Blue Cliff Record. Bi Yang Wu. This record was uh, put together by a, a monk in the, uh, probably the Tang Dynasty. Uh, he was, uh, his name was, I don't know if I would say it right, Chui Do Zhang Xian. Uh, I like this monk very much. It is uh, the last character John Xian. Xian is the same prefix character for all of the disciples here at uh, Malva. Name and the name Xian Huan. So this uh, John Xian means expressing clearly what is important. It would be a literal translation of this name. And later there was another monk, um, Wan Wu Kuching, who also wrote in the commentaries in the 11th century uh, in this Blue Cliff record, which is a, a set of uh, koans or riddles that are given to help us shake us free from this delusion of identifying with our body, or identifying with our feelings, our perceptions, our mental habits, and even our consciousness. So in case number 11 in this new cliff record, um, Wang Bo is instructing a community and he 
and says, all of you people are gobblers of dregs. If you go on traveling around in this way, where will you have tomorrow, today? Do you know that there are no teachers of China in all of China? No. This is a uh, koan, it's a riddle. So we don't want to look at it necessarily literally. At that point, a monk who was taking this literally came forward and said, what about all of those serious places where the order of uh, followers are uh, doing uh, all of these practices in the communities? And Wang Bo said, I do not say that there is no chime, just that there is no, that there are no teachers. This is even more confusing. So the commentary comes along, it fell from the 11th century to make it clearer. And his commentary is, he just can't explain. The titles are scattered. The ice melts. Here is a fellow with a dragon's head, but a snake's tail. Now it's obviously very clear. <laughs> So this is what this is about. So the first place to understand this a little bit is to understand this term gobblers of dregs. So Venerable Kunshi was very helpful. She sent me the Chinese, and uh, I was able to discern with her help a little bit about what the character is. So it turns out that the character, which has to do with the dregs, is Zhou uh, Zhao. And this character, these two characters mean uh, distiller's grain. These are the sentiments that remain after brewing alcohol, considered to be intoxicating substance, thus uh, included with alcohol as a substance not to be uh, consumed. You can imagine that there are people who are making alcohol and then there's this remainder not in, that's left over from making the alcohol and it would be very powerful, particularly when it ferments. Uh, it turns out that one of the other terms for mental formations that uh, Tanisaro Biku gives, and he calls them the uh, fermentations, so here is a good connection between the mental formations or fermentations and what people are drinking. They're consuming the fact that they are really believing that they're their mental habits. This is who I am, this is me, this is what belongs to me. And he's trying to shake them loose from this. He says, all of you are just drinking this we might say in this country, uh, the Kool-Aid. <laughs> drinking, drinking this idea, in, the, in this country, part of what the mental formations is, uh, in this country is the importance of, oh, how much we own, how much we have. This has become a mental condition that somehow or other, the more that we have, happier we will be. This is a part of the dregs. And so, of course, one of the problems that happens is, is that uh, people will go and uh, consume these fermented or toxic substances that derange the mind. I was uh, recently uh, at the, uh, the foot of uh, Horse Tooth Mountain. So uh, it turns out that the Horse Tooth Mountain is one of the areas that is very popular for the consumption of um, THC, marijuana plant. 
very, very popular in Fort Collins, Colorado. So um, after we went out to eat, we uh, went to uh, get frozen yogurt. And uh, afterwards, I'm leaving the frozen yogurt place and I open the door for a family coming in, maybe parents, maybe in their early 50s, and the mother is just giggling away. The father is looking a little paranoid. And two teenager children, a boy and a girl, they're giggling away with the mom. And I received such a strong whiff of marijuana that I realized that it was possible that one inhale might cause me to lose my precepts. So I have to come and confess. It was startling. And I realized that the family that uh, talks together, jokes together, I guess is what happens in, in Colorado. So the gobblers and bricks, <laughs> I didn't realize that I would run into them. Um, probably, you know, not that good idea to smoke marijuana with your teenage children. I'm not sure what that example might give to them. Actually, I am somewhat concerned. So, Master Yellow Cork Tree. I told you that when he first met Bajan, Bajan said, magnificent, imposing, where have you come from? And where have you come for? And Bongo said, not for anything else. He was coming because he wanted his tree to be shaken, free from this post of attachment to the mental formations or fermentations. So shortly thereafter, he was going to take leave of Bajang. And Bajang asked, where are you going? And Wang Bo replied, to Tianzi, where there was a mountain called uh, Kong Kong Shan. Kong Kong Shan is uh, means uh, emptiness of emptiness mountain. And he wanted to pay his respects to the great master, Masu, which means horse patriarch. Maybe he was uh, also spent time at Horse Tooth Mountain. And Baijiang said, uh, Great Master Mao has already passed on. And Huang Bo asked, what does he have to say when he was alive? And Bai Zhang then related the circumstances of his second encounter with Mao Tzu. Bai Zhang said, when Mao Tzu saw me, he approached, he raised his whisk. A whisk is uh, like a little I think probably in this case, like a little fly swatter or something that you use to chase away insects without harming them. Not a swatter, but just something that does, that's what I think it was. And I asked, do you identify with this action or detach from this action? And Mazu then hung his whisk on the corner of his meditation seat. There was a long silence, and then Mazu asked me, later on, when you are flapping your lips, how will you help people? And then Bajan took the whisk and held it up. And Mazu said, do you identify with this action or detach from this action? And I took the whisk and hung it back on the meditation seat. And Masu drew himself up and gave a shout that left me deaf for three days. So this is a story that uh, 
Ajahn took Tong to Huangbo. So these stories are, if we heard these stories and we didn't realize that Zen masters were saying them, we would just say, oh, well, so that's a, maybe an interesting story, maybe not so interesting. But because we know that the master is giving this as an example, we might say, what, what is this about? What does this mean that he gave a shout and couldn't hear for three days? So this is something for us to consider. So all of these stories, these koans, these riddles, are a number of them related to Bongbo and Baijiang and then riddles that were passed on by Bongbo to Linji. The minister who admired and studied with Huang Bo for so many years wrote a poem about him. From the great man he has inherited the mind seal. There is a round jewel on his forehead. His body is seven feet tall. He hung up his staff and stayed ten years by the river Shu. Today his floating conical has crossed to the banks of the Chang. Eight thousand dragons and elephants follow his giant strides. Over ten thousand miles, fragrant flowers join his excellent cause. I hope to serve the master as his disciple, I do not know to whom he will entrust his teaching. Upon hearing this, uh, Huang Bo made no sign of being praised, but said, My mind is like a boundlessness of the great ocean. My mouth spews and red lotuses to nurse a sick body. I myself have a pair of hands with nothing to do. I have never received an idle man. So this particular notion of hands with nothing to do is uh, one of the important teachings that uh, Huang Bo emphasizes and is related to a particular teaching in Buddhism that relates to what is called busylessness. So when a person is in the moment or as Huang Bo calls today, with a big capital T, this moment, attaining this very moment and not allowing the mind to wander. This, when everyone is, has moments. No one has any more than any other. We all have the same number of moments. It's just a question of how much we're in the moment. So when we attain this state of not being busy, we recognize, oh, I don't have to do anything other than to just be in this moment. When I'm in this moment, can't be busy. 
This is part of what is called the three Dharma gates. And the three Dharma gates, I, I've talked about them before, but it's okay to mention them here at the end of my talk again, relate to the three Dharma seals. The three Dharma seals, uh, I'm going to do them in a little bit different order so that they connect to the three Dharma gates. Are no self, impermanence, and suffering. Usually goes impermanence, suffering, no self. These are the three marks of we know that the Buddha's teaching is authentic because if a person says there are there is something which is opposite to this, then they don't understand the teaching. These three Dharma seals are very important because it helps us to understand more deeply how to shake ourselves free from this mental energy that keeps us stuck, that keeps us fermented, keeps us intoxicated by this is me, this is myself, this is who I am, this is what belongs to me. So when we realize that this self, this body, or feelings, perceptions, mental formations, and consciousness are impermanent, and by nature unsatisfactory, designed to be unsatisfactory, to help us to become liberated, to reach nirvana, and that the self is empty of inherent existence, then we understand the three Dharma seals, and then we can enter into the three Dharma gates, which start off with the term emptiness, and then formlessness or signlessness, and then finally wishlessness or desirelessness, which we might also call busylessness. So when we understand this, and when we hear the term that Huang Bo gives, there are no Chan teachers. This is from the perspective of emptiness. He didn't say that there was no Chan, only no Chan teachers. So no attachment to the title, no attachment to the ego, empty of that. When we hear a shout and there is no hearing for three days. This is empty, entering into the three gates. The mind no longer attaches to form and signs, it's the physical body or even the words that identify or characterize our experience. There is no more busyness that takes place and Things were all empty. These three days, or three gates, that the person no longer hears the sounds of the delusion. This is a little bit about the teachings of Master Yellow Cork Tree. Maybe one day we will have Brett plant a male version of that somewhere and in the fall it will be very yellow. We can have a little plaque there that says, here it is. A little bit of the teaching of Bongo. May all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. 
May all beings never be separated from the altruistic joy which is free from suffering. And may all beings dwell in the great equanimity of mind which is free from attachment, aversion,